Uh, that was a beautiful video, don't you all think? It was just amazing how to see, you know, just seeing God uh, at work, you know, in, in our youth's life there, and just using them uh, to proclaim. How do you proclaim? Do you, you use words to proclaim, right? That's pretty much what we're going to be talking about today, so it was neat to see how the Lord worked it out into the timing of that. Um, you know, it's just great to be worshiping with you all this morning, and uh, uh, you know, I just want to thank the Lord for giving me another opportunity to stand before you uh, with His Word. So, our text for this morning is from Matthew, Matthew chapter 5, verses uh, 33 to 37. And if you're new here, visiting us for the first time, or if you've been out of the loop for quite a few weeks, then we have been going through the book of Matthew, and uh, these last few weeks or so, uh, actually it's been a couple of months now that we have been in Matthew chapter 5, meditating on the Sermon on the Mount. And, uh, you know, if you look at the Sermon on the Mount, it is a uh, an inaugural address of Jesus as king, addressing his people, the members of his kingdom, on the foundation principles of how, you know, what he expects, you know, from the members of his uh, kingdom. And we continue uh, to see, like, you know, we talked about Beatitudes, and then Chris put it, you know, uh, um, uh, as an extremely blessed uh, nature is what the Beatitude uh, is. And then we went on to see how Jesus was admonishing the practical uh, the practical ethical uh, um, teachings there. And at the same time, he's been drawing a contrast between how, you know, what, what is given in the Old Testament and how the Jewish legalistic uh, traditions have been, and then, you know, drawing a contrast, a contrast between the actual teaching versus how they were interpreting uh, uh, that. And we're going to be seeing one of those today, and then it has to do with uh, oaths. Um, and so, when I was trying to prepare for this text, I, I tried to search, like, you know, some uh, commentaries on oath. And the minute you put oath or some of your translation might say to swear in, etc., when you put that in, you know, there are a whole lot of pages that talked about, like, you know, profanity and then curse words, etc. But then very few pages that actually talked about oaths and, like, you know, how it is determined in, in the Bible. So, no, we're not going to be talking about, you know, the curse words or the profanity, uh, but then we're going to be talking about and referencing oaths, um, you know, um, or swearing in, as, you know, uh, Jesus calls out uh, here. Um, with that, let's go ahead and uh, read uh, from the scripture and then uh, look to the Lord in prayer. Matthew uh, Matthew 5, 33 to 37. Again, you have heard that it was said to the people long ago, do not break your oath, but fulfill to the Lord the vows you have made. But I tell you, do not swear an oath at all, either by heaven, for it is God's throne, or by the earth, for it is his footstool, or by Jerusalem, for it is the city of the great king. And do not swear by your head, for you cannot make even one hair white or black. All you need to say is simply yes or no, and anything beyond this comes from the evil one. Let's pray. Our gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you for the time that you have given us this morning, O Lord, and we thank you for the text that you have given us, O Lord. And as we look into that text, O Jesus, we ask that you would open up each one of our hearts, you would open up my heart, you would open up my mouth, and O Lord, fill me with your words, O Lord, and as your word says, O Father, the unfolding of your words gives light, it gives understanding to the simple, and uh, we ask for that understanding this morning, O Father. In Jesus' name we ask. Amen. So this oath, so what is an oath? What is an oath? Um, you know, the terms oath or swearing in, vows, making a promise, etc., are used synonymously here, but what is this oath uh, that has been talked about here? Now, if you think about an oath, it's basically a, a public declaration or a public statement that a person is going to do something in the future, and uh, they invoke the divine 
name. Like most of, most of the time, like you know, they call and say, God is my witness that I will do what I have said I would do, right? Like, and that pretty much is, like, you know, in simple terms, that is basically what an oath is or making a vow or making a promise is. And as a part of making that oath, you're basically saying, hey, this is what I'm communicating to you that what I'm about to do, and then I'm going to hold truth, and I'm going to be faithful in fulfilling that. So I want you all to match my actions after this to what I've said, and I'm calling on the name of the Lord to be my witness here. And then what we also know from that oath is that God, they're basically calling God to be a witness uh, for what they have said and how their life is going to line up there. And then they uh, are calling on God's name to hold them accountable if they do not uh, make that oath or, or do, do not meet that uh, oath. And the reason why God has given, you know, the ability to make oaths here, because, you know, Jesus, as you see here, again, you have heard, and when you go back into the Old Testament to see where oaths were given, in the book of Leviticus, we, we see there are so many um, laws that were given to the people of Israel. There's so many regulations, so many rules, and so many, you know, things, you know, the appropriateness of how to do and how not to do, etc. were given. As, and as a part of that is, you know, the term oaths uh, come in. And the reason why God gave them the, um, you know, the laws on oath is so that the people would uphold that truth living and then be able to live truthfully to what they have uh, said. So they would conform their actions, their practical lives would conform to the truth of uh, what they speak. And that is basically what, uh, uh, you know, why the Lord has allowed for that to happen. Now, in, in our terms, like, you know, in our days, like, you know, if you think about anyone who is working in a political setting or in a governmental settings where oath ceremony or swearing into a position is most common, um, for them, like, you know, you know, they have to do these, you know, periodically, and then, like, you know, they will be, uh, uh, you know, assessed based on, like, you know, what they have uh, sworn in. Now, if you're not working in, a, in that kind of a setting where you don't have to actually take an oath in to step into a role that, that is given to you, you might say, well, this may, not, may or may not apply to me. But that is not what it says, right? Like, you know, if you're, a couple of weeks ago, uh, I mean, the last two weeks, uh, we have been meditating on uh, marriage, right? Like, you know, Chris, as he talked about marriage, he talked about vows that the couples make, you know, with each other. Now, that might be, a, you know, whenever we, on your wedding days when you make vows, like, you know, in the presence of the Lord and in, in the presence of the church and your loved ones, uh, whoever are present there, you make vows with each other. And then, you know, after the marriage is done, like, you know, in, your, uh, in the honeymoon period or in the early days of marriage, you know, sometimes we also try to make promises to one another. Uh, it, could be, it could be, you know, as simple as, you know, I'm going to be cleaning the dishes for the rest of my life. Or, you know, I'm going to be cooking for the rest of my life or, you know, um, you know taking out the trash or, like, you know, who's going to love the other person more, etc. These are vows that we make uh, with each other. You know, sometimes we do, uh, you know, uh, some people do hold, uphold those vows and promises, you know, to, until you know, the end of their life. And then some people just forget after the honeymoon period is over. What I'm trying to say is it's not something that is applicable only to people who have a role to actually formally, you know, take an oath or a swear in and get, get in. But it applies to each and every one of us because we all go uh, through those kind of things. And as you look at the first, uh, uh, you know, the, I wanted to just talk about uh, three main points here. And the first one that I wanted to talk about is focused in Matthew 35, 33 to 34a, is your credibility is found in Christ alone. So stay away from the pattern of this world. Well, we did see that in the Old Testament, God has allowed and given them the provision to take oaths, etc. Here, as you see, Jesus in 34a, he's saying, but I tell you, do not swear at all. And then he goes on to say, either by heaven, etc. We'll, we'll look at that in a minute. But then we see that Jesus is talking about, you know, do not swear at all. And before going into this, I want us to look at the intent. We already talked about the intent for which, why, uh, I mean, why God has given this provision of oaths to people therein. But then over the course of time, what has happened is, like, you know, people have 
instead of following the intent of that law that was given, I mean, if you look at the, the, the Ten Commandments, you know, the, what God has given, God is trying to reveal his character, his holiness to the people, and then giving them practical rules on how they can follow God in his character and then in his uh, holiness. But then if you look at how the Pharisees have, Pharisees, the teachers of the law, have distorted the truth that is shared there, and instead of, um, you know, taking oaths the way God has intended it to be, they started to take oaths on an everyday basis for their, uh, for their own righteousness. They would speak something, they would publicly pledge something that they would be truthful in that regard, call on the, invoke the name of the Lord, and then do not follow through on what they have said. And that continued on that tradition, you know, continued on, and, you know, the minute you start to lie, etc., and then it becomes a practice, and it becomes a way of life, and then it shows up in everything that you do in your life. That pretty much is what the Pharisees and the teachers of the law had been doing, and whenever somebody holds them accountable, saying, like, you have invoked the name of the Lord, they started to make excuses, and then saying, well, if you don't swear, if, if you swear by the name of the Lord, yes, you absolutely have to meet that. That, because that is what the, uh, the Bible says in Leviticus 19, uh, 19, 12, and then um, Numbers 32, and then Deuteronomy 23. But then if you swear by heaven, if you swear by earth, if you swear by somebody else, of, or if you swear on your own head, etc., then you're not bound by it kind of a thing. And last week, Chris reminded us one thing. One thing I really liked what uh, Chris said is that any scripture, when we look at that, we should look at it as worshipful to God and not, to tr not, not try to devise the exception clause on how can I escape from what the scripture is saying. And that is exactly what we find the Pharisees and the teachers of the law doing here. And in doing so, they are also teaching the people to do that same thing. They are setting that as an example for them. And the people were also ignorant, and they started to do all of those things. And that's why later in, in, in the Gospels, you see Jesus, when he goes into the temple, he sees how the people are, you know, mistreating and then misinterpreting and then doing all sorts of things. And then he gets, you know, in his... Um, he gets furious and then he overturns the table and then he says, my house shall be called as a house of prayer for all nations and you have turned this into a den of robbers, etc. And that is what we see the Pharisees. Now, we might say like, you know, that was a tradition back then. But if you fast forward that all of these, you know, different centuries that we have lived through, that mankind has lived through and coming down even to 2024, we see that same condition of man carried over, even though there is much improvement in technology, much improvement in civilization, etc. The heart and the state of man's heart still remains the same as it was in the days when Jesus lived and when, when the Pharisees have acted that way. Even to this day, many people try to say things in, a, you know, in an exaggerated way so that people would accept them, people would find them credible, people would find them righteous, and, you know, they, they, they say all sorts of things, but then if you actually look closely at their lives, their lives do not practically conform to the truths that they are speaking. And in fact, if you look at, you know, just our system today, pretty much everything that you do, you have to affirm that whatever you're saying is truth, and nobody's going to take you for face value for what you just say, Right. If you look at, even as you come down to the very basic thing of downloading an app on your screen, on your phone, you have to say, I agree to the terms and conditions of this particular app, and then you click OK, and then you, and that's when you get to use that. You know, whether you're filling out an immigration form, whether you're filling out a lease form at, at an apartment, or, you know, whenever you sign into a job, etc., your job responsibilities, everywhere you have to affirm that you are going to be truthful in what, uh, what you say you're going to do, right? But then do we actually follow through or do we actually, you know, find excuses to find ourselves, you know, not accountable to that particular situation? 
And that's the condition of the Pharisees and the teachers of the law that we see, and Jesus highlights that. And then, you know, in the later chapters, you know, he, talked, he talks extensively about that and addresses that. But then the reason why people do that, the reason why the Pharisees did that, and even today why people do that, is so that they can be, uh, they can be found righteous in the eyes of the people. They can be, uh, you know, respected in the community because nobody's going to follow through on what you've actually done. Like, you know, when they actually follow through, they would deny everything. But then on the face of it, they want to use their words as a matter to express how righteous they are and uh, how uh, credible, you know, whatever they speak is, etc. Now, that is the pattern of the world that we see, you know, in Jesus' time and even today in this time. And Jesus, as he, as he goes on to, like, you know, during his ministry, he goes on to talk about this in depth. And then he says, the way of life that you are living is not correct because that is how the pattern of the world is going. But then as citizens of heaven and as, you know, children of God, we're not supposed to be walking in that pattern, but we are supposed to be walking in the way of Christ. And that's why Christ said, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. We should not be following the pattern of this world, but we should be following the pattern that Christ sets for us in this life. And then he is the truth, and he is not somebody, you know, who's going to say something and does not follow through, does not uh, conform his practical uh, things there, right? Like, you know, he's somebody who's going to say something, and then also his practical actions would match that. And that's why he is the truth that we are to follow. And then he said, like, you know, I am the life. And, uh, uh, you know, when we looked at the Beatitudes, we said, you know, it is the supremely uh, blessed nature. Uh, that's the kind of life that Jesus came to give. He said, you know, I've come to give you life and life to the fullest and not uh, in fractions or a fraction of, uh, you know, what uh, we see in Christ. But then he said, I'm going to give you life, life to the fullest, etc. So if you are to follow Christ, we need to step away from the pattern of this world and uh, our credibility is found only in uh, Christ. And Jesus says, like, you know, here's the way, the truth, and the life, and no one comes to the Father except uh, uh, through him. And then as we move on into uh, the next uh, couple of verses here, 34b onwards, um, but I tell you the truth, do not swear at all, either by heaven, for it is God's throne, or by the earth, for it is his footstool, or by Jerusalem, for it is the city of the great king. And do not swear by your head, for you cannot make even one hair white or black. What you see going on here is that they're trying to, like, you know, um, you know the word of God on oaths is clear, like I said, in Leviticus 19, 12, or in uh, Numbers 32, and then in Deuteronomy 23. What we say, um, see there is that God has given them that provision to take oath, and oaths in his name, invoking God's name, calling God as a witness, so that God would hold them accountable if they you know, for, uh, uh, do not follow through on that. Now, what uh, the Pharisees, the way they have tried to distort that truth is that instead of saying, you know, I'm not going to call in the name of the Lord because that means I absolutely have to meet that, but I'm going to get away with that by saying, I'm going to swear by heaven, I'm going to swear by earth, I'm going to swear by somebody else or my own hair kind of a thing. And the point that Jesus is trying to, uh, the, the Jesus is trying to make here is that we might try to justify what we do, uh, the reason why we're not following through on that, by using a portion of the creation, not realizing that God is sovereign and God is control of everything, no matter what, right? We um, sang earlier, and then we talked about how the mountains and everything like, you know, declare the glory of God. And God is the one who created the heavens, and then in... Um, um, you know, uh, he talks about either by heaven for it is, it is God's throne, right? It is God's throne. So if you are swearing by heaven and saying, I'm not accountable because I'm only swearing by heaven, well, you are actually swearing by God's throne. So God is involved in that. And then if you say, I'm swearing by earth, I'm not accountable for that. Well, you are. The earth is created by God and earth, uh, you know, like all creation declares the glory of God. So you cannot say, I'm not uh, involving God, etc. 
And the point of that is, like, you know, yes, in the, these were the exact words that were used there in the Pharisees, but then if you look at the nature of that, like, you know, and translate that to our practices and our culture today, Sunday is when, like, you know, we come together and then gather with the rest of the body and then worship the Lord together. On Sunday, because, you know, um, many of you do know, uh, and I've shared my testimony before, is that I grew up in a church. And when I say in a church, literally in a church building. So um, if this is the sanctuary, our house was, you know, right beside the sanctuary, a small room. But then we had access to the entire church. So I literally grew up in the church, reading my Bible every day, doing my homework, class. Everything was done, like, literally in the sanctuary. And on Sunday, on Sunday mornings is when, like, you know, I would see people show up in the church. And whenever you see people on Sunday morning, everyone is smiling, everyone is dressed nicely, everyone is so kind, so loving. All of those things show up on Sunday morning. And then, like, you know, because I, you know, I'm living in the church, so I... Pretty much I'm part of the entire life of the church. So on Bible studies on Monday night, Wednesday night, women's ministry, whatever it is, like, and I'm just part of all of that, etc. So whenever people show up for all of these things and whenever people gather with the rest of the body, obviously, you know, there is that a different phase, a Christian phase that shows up there. But then the minute that is done and then when you go out, step out of the door, etc., are we carrying that same Christian face to where we go out from here? Or is that only limited to where we are here? That is basically the heart of what Jesus is trying to get at is that when people, um, you know, when, when we are together with the rest of them, we want to say, hey, this is the covenant of membership I've signed with one another, so I want to uphold that, so I want to be, I want to be, I want to appear as righteous as possible to you. But then when I go out the door, I want to live my own life, and my own life does not match with what I've signed here as a covenant of membership, etc. In your workplaces, in your neighborhood, or you know, in, with the friends that you interact who are outside of the church, or within your family, etc., in all of those interactions, would people see a difference in your, in your interactions there compared to the uh, compared to your interactions with the rest of the church members on Sunday? Or is that the same? If it is not same, which means you're trying to act a different life outside of the church, but then when you are in the church, because you want other people to believe who you are and what you believe, etc., you're trying to put up that false face. We might think, you know, I hope nobody thinks that, you know, God only pays attention to your interactions here in the church and not outside of that because there's no escape right like you know as david in psalm 139 said there's no place in the universe that you can go to and escape god's presence god is sovereign over any, everything and then he is in control of everything so there's really no excuse so your walk whether it's in the church or outside of the church whether you're at your workplaces etc if your walk does not match, your practical life does not match with what your stated beliefs are or what you proclaim uh, who you are to be, then the world is going to know and then that is going to bring you into judgment. And that is why Jesus is saying, you know, that is reminding them through this uh, passage is that God is sovereign and we, as people who have a relationship with Christ, we need to submit to his lordship on, a, on every single day of our lives. Now, he also goes on to give you, you know, an example of, uh, you, know, um, you know, do not even swear by your own head, for you cannot make one hair white or black. Now, I mean, I don't know if there were dyes at that time, uh, and I know you, do, you can color your hair to whatever color you want uh, these days, but then that's only on the outside of your head, right? The follicles, like, you know, they, they do not change color. You, you can never, nobody can ever change a color on them. Now, just think about that, right? Like, you know, earlier in, the, in, in one of the songs we said, uh, God, nobody can count how many stars there are, right? But then God names each one of them and calls them by name, just, j just to get a depth of that. And if you think about your uh, hair, can you all take a wild guess on how many hair do you have on your head? Like a million? 
there could be way too many, right? And uh, just think about, uh, you know, for simplicity's sake, if you, if you just say if you have a hundred, if you have one million hair on your head, um, you know, there are one million requests before God to say, can I turn gray today? Can I turn, you know, some other color today, etc.? And God has to approve each one of those, right? That is basically what he is saying is that even the mundane things like, you know, nobody really pays attention to how many hair falls off of your head. Do you, do, do you even know how many, you know, hair falls off of your head on a daily basis? Nobody knows that, right? We don't even pay attention to that. Even that mundane thing where you don't actually think it matters, it matters to God, and that is how sovereign he is. So if you ever think that God is not going to know this small thought that I have in my, in my, deep in my heart, and it's only there for a fraction of a second, you're wrong. God is going to know that. And in Hebrews, like you know, we talked about that last year, is that the word of God is like a mirror, and whenever we approach the word of God, it's going to lay bare everything in your heart out there on the table, and then his word is like a double-edged sword. It's going to pierce through the soul and spirit, and then it's going to you know, pierce through the bone and marrow, etc. God is sovereign, and there's nothing in this world that you can do to escape his sovereignty and his lordship. So as Christians... If you have a relationship with Christ and if you're walking with Christ, what Jesus is saying is, as part of this, that we all need to realize God is sovereign. Like, you know, we know that in our heart, but in our everyday lives, we might often forget that he is sovereign. But he is saying, but Jesus is saying, you need to re realize his sovereignty and then his lordship in your life. And every single day, you need to submit to his lordship and um, that is how you're going to be glorifying God uh, for who he is. And then as we move on, he says, your credibility is found in Christ alone, so be transformed by the renewing of your minds. Earlier, we talked about, uh, uh, you know, stepping away from the pattern of this world and then submitting to his lordship, and then we need to be renewed. We need to be transformed by the renewing of our minds so that we may know and understand the true and pleasing, the good and pleasing will of God. Now, you know, for those of you who have gone through Colossians 2, 7, or just memorized the scripture, Romans 12, 2, Paul, as he writes there, is where he's talking about this and then said, do not conform any longer to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind so that you may be able to test and approve the good and pleasing will of God. And the point that Jesus is trying to make here is simply let your yes be yes and your no be no. Anything beyond this comes from the evil one. On an everyday basis, um, you know, the earlier point we were talking about uh, the sovereignty and the lordship of Christ in your lives, right? On your throne, you know, um, and, and in the earlier topic we also uh, have seen how Heaven is the throne of God and earth is a footstool. There is also a throne on your heart and uh, is Christ, is the Holy Spirit sitting on your throne as Lord of your lives or are you letting yourself sit on the throne as a, you know, Lord of your life, right? Let your yes be yes and no be no. As Christians who, who are stepping away from the pattern of this world, who are submitting to the sovereignty of God and submitting to the lordship of Christ, we need to just simply obey God in, you know, what he wants us to do, right? When you read through the scripture, when you are fed from the scripture, the scripture is going to talk to you about how you are to live, right? When the scripture nudges you on something, your response should just simply be yes or no. And... Um, when the Holy Spirit, when you're in a situation and then the Holy Spirit nudges and say, here is a person I want you to talk to and then speak the gospel, proclaim the gospel, your answer should be yes or no. It should not be, well, I don't know this person. I might be feeling uncomfortable around this person or I don't know how to start the conversation, etc. We try to make those arguments, etc. And what Jesus is saying is as people who are part of his kingdom, we need to simply say yes uh, uh, our yes be yes and our no be no so that it is simple enough and then our words actually match our actions so that God is glorified in everything that, uh, uh, um, that we say. Now, um, 
that is like if you have a relationship with Christ, yes, you know that is true of you, but then what if you do not have a relationship with Christ? If you do not have a relationship with Christ, you are not even experiencing the 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 extremely blessed nature of the gifts and the beatitudes that God uh, Jesus has spoken to us earlier in the book of uh, Matthew. You might be saying by coming to church every day, by knowing you know the gospel, and by able to articulate that, and by able to you know keep on a smiley face every time you have an interaction, that is not going to you know grant you a relationship with Christ. And what grants your relationship with Christ is your personal identification that you are a sinner and that Christ is the Savior. And only when you do that is when you enter into a relationship with Christ. And once you enter into a relationship with Christ, you know, you need to step away from the pattern of this world, submit to his sovereignty, to his lordship, and then live a life that is, um, <clears throat> that is submitting to the lordship of uh, Christ in our lives. So, um, church, so it's not just the, uh, the formal oath that we talk about, but in our everyday conversation, in our workplaces, in our interactions with, you know, uh, family and interactions with uh, the church family here, all of these settings, God is going to bring everything into judgment one day for every word that we speak, right? So we have to, we have to make sure that our lives are in line with what we say we believe. And I'm not saying, like, you know, your actions are what going, is what going to determine your salvation. It is because of what Christ has done, you have to uh, line up your practical lives, you know, with what, uh, what, what you believe in who Christ is. Okay. So let's close with a word of prayer, and then uh, uh, we'll continue worshiping. Our gracious, loving Heavenly Father, we thank you once again, Lord, for the time that you have given us, O Lord, and for reminding how our words are important in our lives and how truthful we are supposed to be, O Lord. And thank you for reminding us that we have to step away from the pattern of this world, submit to your sovereignty and your lordship, and be transformed in our mindset, O Lord, so that we are following you and glorifying you in every step of our life as we are on the journey to be transformed into your image, O Lord. So I ask, O Lord, that you would allow us to remind, uh, that, that you remind us of this passage every time we have a conversation uh, outside, uh, O Lord. And uh, in all of those conversations, O Lord, help us to always be mindful and to always be looking intentionally to glorifying you uh, for you deserve all of that glory. We thank you and we praise you. In Jesus' name we ask. Amen.